Good morning. My name is Juan Ortuz, and I'm really happy to join the second symposium on machine learning and dynamical systems. The title of my talk is Caution Processes for Time Series Analysis with Application in Scikit Learn. So, uh, the aim of this talk is to give an uh, overall introduction and a uh, survey on how Gaussian processes can be used for si uh, time series forecasting. Uh, at, uh, at the end, I will uh, focus on how you can do this with Scikit-Learn. Uh, but at the very beginning, I will do um, an introduction on the theory behind Gaussian processes. This talk is an extended version of a talk that I gave at PyData Berlin in 2019. So I will cover the uh, content in a little bit more detail and expand on the uh, experiments that I run with Scikit-Learn. So at the very beginning, I will start with, uh, with the Bayesian linear regression just to, uh, to get started. I, and then I will try to introduce and motivate the Gaussian process regression uh, following uh, the reference, the classical reference on, on this topic by Rasmussen and Williams on um, machine learning and Gaussian processes. So a, a big portion of this talk is based on this uh, seminal reference. Uh, and then I will try to go and motivate how the notion of kernel arises in a natural way from both uh, the weight point of view and the functional uh, point of view. Uh, then I will talk a little bit about the kernels that exist and might be used for different purposes. Uh, I will briefly talk about hyperparameter estimation. Uh, and at the very end, I will give a concrete example on how this can be uh, used for time series analysis. And at the very end, I will comment on the computational challenges. So just to warm up, so to say, let us recall the notion of a normal, uh, multi-normal distribution. So this is a generalization of the usual normal distribution uh, in one variable. Uh, so again, the expression is, is on the slide, but what is important is that as in the uh, simple case, uh, the multi-normal distribution is defined by two, essentially two parameters. One is the mean vector, which, uh, is encoded in this vector m, and all. And in addition, the k not matrix, which denotes the covariant matrix, which is a symmetric and positive definite one. So this will be the sigma in the usual formula for the normal distribution, and the mean m somehow defines the center of the distribution, which in this case is multidimensional. Uh, and the covariance matrix uh, defines the orientation. So not every uh, no, combination of Gaussian uh, distributions arise, uh, gives rise to a multinormal distribution. So on this example, we have on the left-hand side, uh, actually a, a samples from a multinormal distribution. Uh, but on the right-hand side, we have a, a one which is actually not multinormal, but their marginals still normal. Uh, but anyway, this is just more to set up notation. So uh, let us continue with the Bayesian linear regression uh, example. So let us consider the simple case on which you have a data points X and Y. So X are supposed to be the, the known variables, the features, and Y the observations. Uh, and we would like to model those as a linear combination uh, of, the, of the input. So in this case, the X vectors actually be, belong to a, a Euclidean space RD. Uh, and then the formula is, that we want to fit is, is essentially F uh, as a X transpose B. And then we model uh, our data as this linear model plus a Gaussian noise. And the Gaussian noise is centered at zero and it has a, a standard deviation of sigma n. So if you see in the plot, this is nothing else as a, yeah, these a blue points denote the x, y pairs. And the red line in this example is the true value of, uh, of the line which generates this data. Uh, 
So in this case, uh, the vector v is uh, the vector one three. One means the intercept, uh, and three is the slope. We can always encode the first entry as a uh, one to encode the intercept. And in here, the the uh, standard deviation zero point five. So the question is, how can we estimate these parameters from the data? And the Bayesian way of doing this, so to say, is to estimate the distribution of this beta uh, parameters uh, through the Bayes theorem. So roughly speaking, uh, the distribution of B, the vector b, given x and y, meaning the beta, is going to be proportional to the likelihood at the prior. So the prior encodes what we know, or like the previous knowledge that we know uh, without seeing the data about our specific problem. And the likelihood is somehow the probability of, okay, given certain uh, set of parameters P, what's it like, like the probability of obtaining this given data. So the prior, it's really about kind of domain knowledge and the likelihood it's about what the data is telling us. And Bayes theorem uh, tries to combine uh, these two. So uh, the prior, uh, when you, there's a lot of data, might not be uh, that, uh, let's say, relevant for the prediction. Uh, but when we have smaller data sets, or, or when we want to be uh, more careful about this pay, the range of, of, on which these parameters can live, then we really need to make sure that our priors make sense. And for that, a really good practice is to do prior simulation. So in this case, we assume that our a beta, a B parameters are actually normally distributed with a, a, co with a covariant matrix a given by 2, 1, 1, 2. And again, as we have B as a vector, this is a multinormal distribution. So uh, this is how the distribution looks on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, what uh, we did was to generate a sample from this vector and then uh, create lines out of it. So we see that our real line and our data actually fits on this uh, prior uh, predictive uh, sampling. Uh, that means it's a it's a okay prior to 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 work with, uh, and the likelihood in this case uh, actually turns out to be also a multinormal distribution in a closed form, uh, assuming that all of the data is independent. Then we arise uh, to this formula on the uh, on the likelihood. Uh, but as you might know, like finding analytical solutions for Bayesian inference problems, it's rather hard. And in practice, what is usually done is uh, to run a Monte Carlo uh, Markov chain uh, simulation. So that actually we can sample from the posterior distribution uh, and actually have the samples instead of having a closed form. Uh, so this is an example using PyMC3. Uh, so on the left hand side, you can see the distributions. So uh, the first parameter is close to one, around 0.95. And the uh, slope is uh, yeah, around 3, 3.1, which is, uh, let's say, makes sense from how the data was generated. And on the right hand side, we see how the chains actually look like they had uh, converged to the a posterior distribution. Uh, and now when we want to do a, like the predictions, we will of course sample uh, from this parameter space and then weight against our test set. But in this specific case, actually we, always, we have an analytical solution from the posterior. So given this likelihood and this prior, actually you can integrate this into a closed form. And what we get is actually that the posterior probability distribution of the B parameters is a multinormal distribution, which again is defined by two components, by the mean and the covariance. And 
uh, everything can be written in terms of this A matrix, which is uh, X, X transpose. This is a, X is the design matrix. And here we have the uh, inverse of the covariance matrix of the power probability. So this should resemble somehow the expression of the ordinary least squares approach uh, for linear regression. And we see that indeed the posterior distribution is still it's a multinormal, but the range is rather small. So here the scale it's, it's rather uh, low or like small as compared to the power one. And this is just a, how we will sample on a, the mean a, of, of, of the distribution. A, and again, as we were saying, a, in this particular case, actually to do uh, predictions, we will need to average over this uh, posterior distribution uh, given any input point X star. So during this presentation, and this is uh, something that I also took from uh, Rasmus and Williams' uh, book, the X star will denote like a test set or uh, out of sample uh, uh, observations on which we generate predictions after inference. So uh, in this case, uh, this is again a, a multinormal distribution. And it's really important to see that these uh, prediction or credible intervals are really about uh, the, the kind of latent variable, which is F. If we would really like to have uh, the credible intervals on the observations, we will need to add uh, uh, the noise variance to account for that. Uh, so that the credible intervals are actually much wider. So actually this, this trick or this approach actually serves for a actually nonlinear cases. So, and this is what is called the, the kernel trick. So if we have a nonlinear problem, we, but we can still write it in a linear way uh, by just taking a, a, an inner product, uh, then we can mimic the same computations. So let us be precise. So assume that we have a map phi from RD, which is where our features live, into a bigger space Rn, uh, which is just a map. It doesn't need to be linear. Uh, but, and if we would still like to model this uh, as an inner product against some parameter vector B, and um, yeah, again, assuming some Gaussian noise, then we can replace everything that we did just by changing x uh, to uh, x, uh, taking the image of x on the phi. And one actually see, can see that uh, all the computations and the analytical solutions hold true. So again, if we want to see the predictive distribution of giving a, a new point x star, uh, then this is a normal distribution, well, a multinormal distribution uh, on which we have a mean and a covariance. And it's not important the explicit form of it. Uh, so these are details that you can look into the literature, but what it's important to notice, and this is a key observation, is that the mean and the covariance can always be written as product of the form a phi transpose sigma phi. Uh, so this is always uh, the case. So you can actually uh, take this form and replace x with the, its image under phi. Uh, and you can always put the mean and the covariance in terms of this factor. Uh, so that means for prediction purposes, you don't need to know what a uh, phi is itself, you just need to know what phi transpose sigma phi uh, on the test and the, so the training set uh, look like. And this motivates the definition of a kernel. So in the context of linear regression, uh, we define the kernel or covariance functions as a, for two vectors x, x a prime, uh, by taking this product of a uh, phi x transpose sigma p uh, phi x prime. And again, the motivation is because the predictive distribution 
on a, a dissipation linear regression a, can be written a, just in terms of these products. And this should give a, a nice way in introducing a Gaussian process regression or a Gaussian process in this case. So I'm going to try to define a, or like state the definition and then make sense out of it. So the main idea is at the first, like on the first slide, we saw how uh, the multinormal distribution was a generalization of the usual Gaussian distribution. Uh, so we should, uh, people like to think that Gaussian process is a, a generalization of a multinormal distributions into uh, uh, infinite dimensional space. And how to see with this infinite dimensional space? Well, this is a space of functions. And the main idea is that if I'm like if I'm giving a covariance function or a kernel, then this implies a distribution over a function space. So let us be a, a little bit precise about the definition. So a Gaussian process is a collection of random variables on which any finite number a half a multinormal a distribution. So uh, if I have any subset of this uh, collection of random variables, their distribution is a uh, multinormal. And again, as we saw on the first example, this is not guaranteed. So because as we saw, there was an example on which the marginals were Gaussian, but the, the, the joint distribution wasn't. Uh, and a Gaussian process, which we denote by GPMK, is actually completed specified by two things. One, it's a, the mean function, and a, the other is the covariant function. So the mean a, is nothing else as the expected value of a, yeah, the Gaussian process, a, and the kernel is the expected value a, of the Gaussian process minus the mean. So these two quantities specify the the Gaussian process. And here F is the assignment. So that for, we have a yeah, parameterization space, which we call X. And for such X, we can uh, extract a, a random variable so that these uh, expectations uh, make sense. So just as a heads up, usually a four time series analysis, this parameterization space is actually time. So uh, let us try to see how we already have seen a Gaussian process by looking into, let's say, how to reinterpret the first example. So let us, if we consider the map uh, that at each point, I give myself a phi x transpose b, and here b it's a, has a prior, so it's a, it's a, it's a random variable, defines a, pro, a, a Gaussian process on which the mean uh, is zero and uh, the uh, covariance or the kernel is actually what we had before. So just think about uh, why is this example, let's say in agreement with our definition. So notice that uh, whenever we have a sum of this sort, uh, then as B it's a multinormal distribution, then this product is going to be a, a normal distribution by definition. So actually the first condition holds. Uh, and about the mean uh, and the kernel, again, this is a simple computation and it's uh, quite close to what we did before. So uh, this shows that the Bayesian, Gaussian, uh, the Bayesian uh, linear regression that we saw uh, fits quite well and it's a legit uh, Gaussian process with respect to this definition. And for future reference, we denote a uh, with capital K, XX, on the design matrix or the parameterization space, uh, the matrix of poise wise kernel images. Okay, so uh, it's, let, let us try now to see how uh, this kind of weight point of view or uh, on which we run the inference on the parameters a b can actually be translated into a function space view and again uh, what we want to understand is the statement that 
a, giving a covariance functions, this a, implies a distribution over a function space. A, so here, let us consider some input points x star, which is again, should uh, be understood as the test set. Uh, and then we can consider uh, the prior uh, of these uh, input points as a multinormal distribution with mean zero and a kernel k x star x star. And why zero? Well, we saw that uh, the Gaussian process had mean zero. Uh, and this k in this k in this case is actually this uh, com the, the one coming from the kernel trick uh, phi x transpose sigma p phi x. So how can we see this as a, a, sam a sampling over functions? Well, for a, any of these points a, x star, we can sample from this multinormal distribution. Uh, and this will give rise uh, to lines. So uh, for this specific uh, case, if I'm giving a kernel, uh, which in this case is the, this inner part of kernel, uh, all of the functions that I'm going to generate are actually linear. And this is uh, just because of how the kernel was defined. Uh, but it's essentially the same computation, but a conceptually, it's a little bit different because I'm not sampling over points, but here I'm sampling over functions. And how, how do I sample over functions in practice? Well, I just need to give a realization of the images uh, given some target points. Uh, and this is how the plot uh, looks like. Uh, so if I want to now do inference uh, on to try to understand or like get the the, the parameters of my linear regression, uh, what I can do is to go into the joint distribution. So Y uh, always denote the observation, uh, and F is the true or latent variable which I would, would like to, uh, to predict, so to say. So following uh, the uh, idea behind, we, we consider this as a, as a normal, multinormal, distribution with mean zero. And uh, the kernel here just factors into these different, uh, like the X and X star. And the only one thing to notice is that on this entry, we still want to add the, the variance on the training set because I am actually consider Y and not F itself. So this is the joint distribution of my training data X and my test set or out of sample set X star. Uh, but this is not what we want. We actually want to condition on the data. We want to know what's F star condition on the data. Uh, and we can uh, do this uh, in practice. And in this case, also analytically. So if I want to uh, do this, I, I, one reaches a expressions we, we have seen before. So if I condition on x, y, and a, x star, then a, the prediction distribution, but in this case in a function space Q, is a multinormal a distribution which has a mean and a covariance. And it's no surprise that everything can be written in terms of the kernel. So this is exactly the same computation as we saw before, just a, replacing capital K with the explicit expression of the kernel. But in this case, we interpret this not as like a, a posterior on the parameter, but a posterior on the function space. And once I sample on the functions, uh, I get straight lines. And as we will see in a minute, this is actually a, a feature from the kernel itself. So just to summarize the Bayesian, uh, linear regression from the weight uh, point of view, which is the usual one, uh, actually defines a Gaussian process. Uh, and this can be translated into the function space view on which we really sample uh, given a kernel to obtain functions uh, themselves. And this is why uh, people uh, often think about Gaussian processes as infinite dimensional uh, analogs of the multinormal distribution. But so, 
this was about the, the, the linear case. And even though our, our uh, case was uh, simple, uh, to begin with, actually, we, we saw that everything was encoded on the kernel. So, even, so the linearity, so to say, of the functions generated by the Gaussian process were encoded by the kernel. So uh, this gives rise to a big uh, opportunity to explore new uh, ways of generating Gaussian processes. And the only thing that we need to change or to explore are different type of kernels. So there's a zoo of kernels that people use, but here I summarize a couple of them uh, which are quite uh, useful and uh, yeah, quite uh, common to use for applications. Uh, so we have the first is the dot product kernel, which is essentially the one that we saw uh, before, which is x transpose uh, sigma p x uh, dagger uh, uh, prime, sorry. Uh, and I can add a constant term and actually take polynomials out of it. And what's really nice is that this power m uh, that I include in the kernel uh, will, uh, let's say, be reflected on kind of the polynomial uh, nature of the function that we generate from the Gaussian process. Another very common kernel is the square exponential, uh, which has this explicit form. Uh, so it's, uh, yeah, it's a, uh, and, and, exponential with a negative sign and yeah you, you we need to be uh, careful because it always needs to be uh, positive definite but one actually can see that uh, if we will take a, or it can be interpreted this kernel as being a, the limit of uh, let's say a, all of the polynomials put together a, and that's why this square exponential function will always gives rise a to smooth functions, as we will see in a minute. So it's are going to be C infinity. So there are other kernels which might restrict the degree of smoothness, like the Russian quadratic. And we can also uh, model a uh, periodic signals via this X sine squared uh, uh, function. But there are a lot of them. And uh, we'll see uh, later how we can combine them to make them work for a concrete application. So if we go to another example on which we would like to model a, a nonlinear function, then a, we would not like to use the kernel from the Bayesian linear uh, regression, but try something which captures this, this nonlinearity. And here we will see how to work with the square exponential kernel. So in this example, I just took a a, a sum of two sine functions, uh, but I'm, of course, uh, assume that I don't know that, and I have uh, these points. And the, the, the red line is something that I would like to know or learn from the data, which is this Latin function f. But in reality, I just have these points. So I would like to fit a, a curve on, on this cloud of points. In this case, I have uh, 500 uh, points. So here I'm going to try to, to, to give a little bit of code, which uh, is not really relevant, but it's really trying to, to see how this is generated in practice. Uh, I'm, I'm using Python for it. And as we'll see later, uh, I'm gonna then see how we can use scikit-learn to do that. But uh, the first thing that we would like to do is uh, run a prior simulation to see whether uh, our kernel uh, makes sense. Uh, one thing that I actually forgot about uh, to mention is that a lot of these kernels uh, have hyperparameters. And these hyperparameters, we could input ourselves, uh, but we could also let uh, the data, uh, let's say, learn from the data. And this is going to be a discussion in, in a couple of slides. Uh, but anyway, uh, here I chose a, a square exponential kernel. So what we see is that if I uh, take a sample from a multinomial distribution uh, with mean zero and uh, the covariance uh, matrix given by the point-wise kernels uh, computation, uh, and I just take a multinormal sample from that and I evaluate them in a grid of points, 
this is actually the realization of my functions. Uh, this is how they look like. So notice that overall, uh, the range of these uh, functions that are uh, simulated actually captures the data where I'm in. So the prior seems uh, okay. And notice that uh, it gets more wiggly, meaning that uh, they are not just straight lines as in the previous example, uh, but actually I get a more degrees of, of, of freedom, so to say. And also notice that all of these functions are really smooth. So this is how the uh, prior distribution works when I have a grid of 100 points. Uh, and then if I go to the joint distribution, uh, this is how the, let's say the heat map of my covariant matrix looks like. So it's no surprise to see that most of the mass of, of, of these uh, covariance functions is concentrated a, a, a along the diagonal. I, and this is exactly from, from the form of, the, of this squared exponential. So of course, it's going to be maximized once, uh, whenever this is uh, close to zero. So we clearly see a block structure here, uh, which is no surprise. Uh, from the uh, definition of my covariance function on the joint distribution. So you can actually see the, the four components. But now when I condition, then uh, this is how the uh, covariant matrix looks like. So it's still focusing on, on, on close points, but also uh, I have a, a, a kind of global nature, right? So say if you think about the the colors fading out here is really local, meaning it just happened what's happening with uh, it, just care about what's happening on the next point. But my uh, covariance function, once a condition on the data, actually gets a little bit more global. So, uh, again, the function, the, the expression is exactly the same as in the uh, Bayesian regression, a uh, linear regression example, but just the kernel changes. And this is how uh, the uh, uh, posterior distribution on, on the functions looked like after I condition over the data, uh, on, on the data. Uh, so if you want to see it as a code, there's a, a function that computes the Gaussian process parameters. So it does uh, these uh, uh, computations, which I guess is a, it's a topic that we will discuss at the end on the computational challenges, but uh, assume that this is the case. So we can compute these Gaussian process parameters from the kernel function, uh, the kernel function on the uh, training set, uh, on the test set, and on the mix, uh, meaning k x uh, x star, and of course the 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 noise on the data that I'm assume to be no, uh, and once I get uh, the mean and the covariance, I can sample from a multinormal distribution uh, with such a parameters. And then we see that our, uh, all of our functions actually fit quite well this Latin variable that we, uh, that we know it's true. Uh, and it, it gets the correct degree of smoothness. Uh, so this is another example on how uh, one can use a Gaussian processes to, to model nonlinear function, which I guess it's one of the most uh, use cases uh, for, for example, clarity, kernel density estimation and so on. By the way, I will, at the very end of the talk, I will give reference to all of these codes so that you can reproduce and see it yourself. But uh, this example we have essentially done by, by hand. Uh, and of course, a big a question is, okay, how shall we handle hyperparameters? Because as you might expect, uh, this, uh, the, the kernel function encodes how local I want my problem to be. Uh, and changing this, for example, the scale on this sine square uh, kernel into a bigger or a small value actually will affect this as well. Uh, so how to choose the hyperparameters and also we want to avoid overfitting right we don't want to just this be a uh, based on on the training data because if we want to do to generate predictions especially for time series we don't want a uh, we want to control for an overfit so i guess there are very mess a lot of methods uh, that we could uh, use i'm going to briefly talk about 
say one, which is how to uh, get those by maximizing the log marginal likelihood. Uh, but there's another one which is widely used, uh, which is namely cross validation. Is what we be particularly explicit about controlling for the uh, for the overfitting challenge. Uh, for cross validation, uh, I'm not going to go deep into it, but uh, for some of of these uh, uh, kernels, uh, there are explicit formulas for the leave one out cross validation. Uh, yeah, uh, expression so that we can test uh, and get this hyperparameter. So even though that it can be computationally expensive, in some cases we can reach analytical solutions. Uh, but let me go into how this uh, maximizing the marginal likelihood would work. Again, I would recommend uh, to go into chapter five of Rasmussen Williams' book because they really give a, a really nice intuition behind it. Uh, and I don't want to uh, re do this here, but just to briefly mention on the on the motivation about it. So what they do is, uh, or like how they explain uh, the reason behind it is again through the Bayesian inference. So uh, one can actually regard, even though that the Gaussian processes are non-parametric because of this infinite dimensional feature, uh, one can actually think about the training data on the Latin variable f as parameters uh, of, uh, of this Gaussian process, as, as true parameters, so to say. So we could run like Bayesian inference, which is somehow what we're doing, to try uh, to, try to exp uh, uh, find the, the posterior. But as we mentioned at the very beginning, uh, finding analytical expressions for these uh, uh, posterior distributions is quite hard, and in practice has, is not really feasible uh, because we need to do integrals uh, which are uh, pretty hard to do. So uh, if theta uh, denotes uh, some hyperparameter that we would like to, 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 to find out, and then on the Bayesian uh, equation, the denominator uh, that we will have is uh, this one, which is the, what is called the mar marginal likelihood. And uh, this is uh, pretty hard to compute. So uh, as a first approximation, we, instead of having to compute this to, to do the full inference, we can maximize uh, this with respect to theta. Uh, exactly, so this is one approximation, but what is really nice is that for uh, this uh, Gaussian process regression problem, we can actually compute Ex express uh, this, uh, the log marginal likelihood uh, as a function of the kernel, which by itself uh, encodes or has hidden the hyperparameters. Uh, so in practice, what we need to do is to maximize uh, this expression and solve for the hyperparameters. And what is quite interesting to see, uh, and I think it's a really nice discussion in Rasmus and Williams, uh, book is how this already, uh, maximizing the log uh, marginal likelihood already encodes this trade-off between fitting the data and penalizing for model complexity. Uh, so the first term, uh, which has data y, actually it's uh, fitting the data. Uh, and the second term, it's uh, in certain sense penalizing the complexity of the model. And the third term is just a normalization constant. Uh, so in practice, and as we will see uh, for a concrete uh, case for scikit learn, this is how you could uh, learn or estimate the uh, hyperparameters from the data. Uh, there's a big warning, and is that uh, there's no guarantee to find a global uh, minima or maximum. Uh, they might be a uh, local minima as well. So uh, this could be a, a little bit of a problem to get stuck in a local minima. So uh, what we could do or 
one approach would be to run this optimization uh, with different starting points uh, and try to account for that in, in that way. But definitely I will recommend to follow the discussion on Rasmus and William. Uh, and something that I'm not going to go deeper into, uh, but it's really one key, and I guess one of the features that makes Gaussian processes quite flexible for applications is that uh, the kernel space is actually quite rich in the sense that it has an algebraic structure. Uh, and in a nutshell, it one can show one that the sum, the product, uh, and the convolution uh, of kernels is again a kernel. Uh, and we actually take direct sums and uh, yeah, tensor products of M2 create new kernels. So actually, from this kind of intuitive kernels that we saw, like the dot uh, kernel, uh, the square exponential, uh, and the one which has a period, the, the, this exponential sign kernel, one can build a new kernels out of it. And a, in practice, a, the intuition behind a problem or where the a, scientist or analyst needs to really think is how a, the kernel or which kernel is the, mo it's the more appropriate for a specific problem. A, and there's a big a, theory where we can match a, the kernels uh, with a spectral theory and, and actually get information from the uh, kernel features via its spectrum by consider these L2 integral operators. But that's something that I, want, I don't want to discuss now, but it's explained in chapter four of William, uh, Rasmus and William. So in order to understand how we could combine these kernels, I want to finalize with a concrete example of how we can use this for time series forecasting. So although this is a toy-like model, I think it illustrates quite well uh, the theory that we saw uh, and how we can use kernels to build a more complex models. So let us start with a simple uh, periodic uh, data on which we uh, add a Gaussian noise. So uh, the problem now, this is the complete training set on I, when I have a thousand observations uh, and I want to train on the first, I would say 70% of the data and then uh, predict using a Gaussian process regression uh, with a scikit-learn. So scikit-learn provides all of these kernels already built in uh, I guess we just you just need to be careful about the convention of wh where the hyperparameters uh, are encoded, uh, just because of conventions. Uh, and it's pretty straightforward to to fit this model. So uh, for this specific case, we have two components. One is a white kernel, which is essentially a white noise, which uh, is uh, encoding the uh, variance of the training set, the sigma n. Uh, and the second component, K1, is a constant kernel times an X sine squared. And that's not a surprise uh, because we know uh, there's a, a, a periodicity there. One can impute the uh, hyperparameters uh, explicitly, like here I'm doing with the length scale, but we can also give a a, a bound on which uh, these uh, parameters would be tested or like found via uh, maximizing the log marginal likelihood. So yeah, we define our kernel and there's a Gaussian process regression object on which we can uh, just uh, fit and, and, and generate predictions. So this has an input the kernel, the number restart of the which are the number of times I want to run my optimizer, again, trying to account for local minima. And then whether, whether we would like to normalize the data or not. Usually we like to do it if we want to model this with a mean a zero in, in a regression process. A, and I will show, so again, this I will provide the link to this code, a, but a, this is a, how simple and straightforward is to do it a, with scikit-learn. 
So again, one good exercise that I, it's always good to do is to run a prior sampling. This is the plot that we see on the first part of the slide. So we see that actually our training data fits quite well. And we see that actually all of these uh, prior uh, samples are actually periodic. I, and in the bottom, we actually see the prediction. So the red line uh, defines where like the train test split and the fit looks quite well. And also the, well, the, the model is simple and, and it's somehow straightforward how to, to select the kernel. Uh, I provide metrics and other diagnostics on the notebook, on the Python notebooks, uh, let's say attached uh, to this presentation. So what if we now add a, a linear trend uh, into this first sample uh, data? So what we would like to do here is to add another kernel which will account for that. Uh, there are various ways of doing that, but uh, in this uh, concrete example, I added a squared sine exponential, or which is often of also called radial basis function kernel, uh, which is uh, this one. And then I just added this component into my previous kernel. Uh, so again, this is uh, on the uh, top, we see the prior simulation. Uh, and on the bottom, the prediction of the Gaussian process. Uh, I guess we could try to use uh, a dot product kernel as well. And if you want to have smooth functions, uh, I guess this radial basis function, uh, it's quite appropriate. But if you want to model this with a lower degree of smoothness, you can use also the Russian quadratic. Uh, so if we take another step further and add another periodic component, you see that I actually added a periodicity which uh, has a lower, uh, higher frequency than the previous one. So you still see the structure, uh, but sometimes this is hidden with uh, the noise. So what can we do here? Well, we can actually add another uh, exponential sine squared kernel into the previous one. So one to account for the first periodicity, the second one, the uh, RBF kernel for the trend. And this one is about the, the second component. And in practice, we might have a, a, a guess, a, an estimate on the periodicity. So we see that this is lower than the first one, uh, just to help the, the model converge. But we still can, uh, on the one hand side, if we know it by heart, just hard coded or otherwise look for the for it by specifying the bounds on the scikit learn kernel. And then we add all of these kernels and run our analysis, our, our, our inference, and, and this is how the results look. Again, it's always good to, to plot the prior samples to see whether the kernel selection that we did uh, actually we capture the data because if this prior uh, it's quite off from the training sample. It's going to be really hard for the model uh, to fit it. And it's particularly hard when you have a limited set of data. And lastly, we can actually add another trend, which is nonlinear. Uh, maybe if you want to account for a saturation effect or, uh, yeah, or like linear linearity, just a first approximation. So we just add like a square root times a, a parameter. And what we add here is we left the kernel, but at a rational quadratic uh, and actually left a lot of the parameters free. So, uh, so that the, you can actually look into, uh, or the data can provide us with the best fit. Uh, and again, these are the prior simulation and this is how uh, the, a model looks like. Notice that the credible interval becomes to get a little bit wider because there's an uncertainty on how this trend will develop in the uh, out of sample. So this, uh, to be honest, it's a, it's, a, it's a risk. So I guess it's a Gaussian processes for time series analysis work pretty well. Once you know a little bit, let's say, or there's a clear intuition about the a generating process of the data, 
and if and also if there's this a uh, uh, kind of way from going from this a uh, domain knowledge or yeah knowing how the data was generated and encoded this into a kernel uh, and I think that's uh, where a uh, Gaussian process for time series uh, are quite powerful, at least at forecasting. If you want to like fill NA's values uh, with uh, yeah, kind of a uh, smooth uh, but nonlinear data that also works quite well because you still want to do inference within the range on where you train and set a uh, training set lives. So uh, of course there are a uh, computational challenges. Uh, because essentially we need to take the inverse of certain of the covariance matrix and this can be quite expensive if you have a lot of data so I mean on, on uh, Rasmus and Williams there's a there's this um, algorithm to do that using the uh, Cholesky decomposition uh, to speed this a little bit up uh, but there's a lot of work around how to let's say speed this up with a certain approximation uh, so this is a big uh, topic because of course a uh, computational uh, efficiency it's quite important these days i'm not going to comment this uh, explicitly but i will put that on the on the references uh, so yeah that's about it so i hear about i comment on the on mutual references so the first one on on, of Gelman uh, and others on Bayesian data analysis is a great way to see a concrete case on how Gaussian process can be regression can be used for time series analysis, and also they explain a little bit on the on this uh, approximation of the computational challenges. There's this great reference about statistical rethinking uh, by McEarl, and I strongly recommend it uh, if you want to go deeper into Bayesian analysis. Uh, on this presentation, we see that I have a couple of blog posts which actually go through the code that I explained. So I hope you can find that useful. Uh, and of course, a uh, Gaussian process for machine learning by Rasmussen and Williams is uh, one key uh, reference that I use for this talk and I think it's a great introduction uh, to the topic. Uh, I hope that the blog post that I provide uh, also give a kind of a the intuition on on how to to code this and to to see it in a in an explicit example but it's it's a it's a great reference this book uh, so thank you very much uh, again i'm really happy uh, for this uh, remote setting i'm looking forward to listening and watching all of the talks uh, you can find all of this uh, code and presentation on my website and GitHub, and you can scan this QR code to go directly to it. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, and thank you again for the opportunity.